franchise secrets, Eric Von Horn. If you're not a part of the Franchise Secrets Facebook group, what are you waiting for? It's FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. I cannot believe how valuable this group turned out to be. When someone asks a question, the feedback is honest, authentic, very helpful, and it's from multiple perspectives. If you're not sure that you're getting the most accurate information about franchising, then check out the largest, most helpful Facebook group in all of franchising. Whether you're a Z, a Zor, a buyer, or investor, join our free Facebook group at FranchiseSecrets.com slash Facebook. Hey, in this episode, uh, I've got my good friend, Stephen Verb and Henry Kim. This is uh, kind of a unique one because they've been uh, in franchising for 15 years and business partners, and they've had some amazing success. But two years ago, they made a decision to get more into passive investing. Fast forward, they've, uh, we get into it in the show, but they've done close to 30 different passive investment deals. It's changed the way they think, changed the way they do things, and uh, they wouldn't have been able to do it if they hadn't gotten into franchising and uh, set up their franchise in the right way. At one point, Henry or, uh, Stephen gets really honest about his journey, the ups and the downs, and how the partnership and the brand that they had together uh, was really what pulled him out of that and how he went on to uh, just have this amazing lifestyle. So I think you'll really enjoy this show as we get into all kinds of things with actionable takeaways for all of you on investing, how to invest, what vehicles to invest in, um, how to invest uh, in these different vehicles in terms of tax saving strategies and uh, all kinds of different stuff. So this will be a real fun one with my mastermind members, uh, uh, Henry and Steven. Enjoy the show. All right, so I got my good friends Stephen Verib, aka Verib, and Henry Kim. I know these two guys very well from a franchising side, investing side, and just as good people, good dads, great kids, and two guys that love to uh, take a lot of vacations. So, welcome to the show, guys. Hey, Eric, Thanks, glad to be here for sure. All right, Absolutely. let's <laughs> let's. So, you guys, uh, just real, give the quick rundown of what you guys own or have owned. Just a quick, like, Stephen, why don't you give the quick rundown of what you guys own or have owned? Uh, let's see, Massage Envies for fifteen years, a handful of those. Uh, regional developers at one point in time for Amazing Lash Studio. Uh, still have a couple of those locations remaining a massage school that um, we opened about five years ago and we're uh, starting to scale that now to our second location. Uh, we're working on that. Um, am I leaving anything out, Henry, aside from like the different investments and stuff we've gotten into? No, I think you covered what we're into now. Yep. I like it. I like it guys. So I wanted to give context and I like, I like this because you guys are doing a lot of different investments. We're going to be talking about that. And then you guys have been regional developers, area developers slash masters, and you've been a part and are part of a concept now that you've seen kind of full circle um, actually both brands full circle of the, of area developers or area reps. Um, so you've seen it as having area reps, you've been area reps, and, uh, and you've been franchisee. So at some point, we'll probably talk about this after the show and kind of more of the conversational piece, but I want to talk about area development because I love area development. I think, I think most people that are looking at buying a franchise should absolutely add this to the list of things that they would look for, but we'll get into all of that uh, after the show and have some good discussion around that. But today I wanted to bring you guys on to talk about the investment side of things because uh, there's so many uh, franchisees out there that get so caught up into their business and they do well, and then they just keep expanding and put more money into more of their units, which is good, or they just put it into the stock market, their money, and then just let it ride. And sometimes that's good. And right now it's bad. Um, and there's other people like you that have had success in franchising. And a lot of our friends have had the same and they are doing other things with it. And they are, they're becoming expert at passive investing. So can you guys, uh, you know, 
have some, uh, give us some uh, color on that. And when did you guys start to go to have that shift from I'm a franchisee to I want to become really good at finding passive investments? All right. Well, let me take a stab at it. <laughs> you know, um, we've had, you know, we've been very fortunate um, with our, our franchise businesses and, and, you know, they, they cash flow very well. Um, you know, we started out with just buying three licenses for Massage Envy and then acquired three more. <clears throat> and, you know, you kind of get used to making money that way. Right. And so you get attached to it. And so you want to, you know, so then we branched out into Amazing Last Studio. Then we opened up two more brick and mortar uh, locations. And so, you know, I think that it's hard to make a shift um, when you're accustomed to making money that way. But I think it was you, Eric, that kind of introduced us to passive investing and you introduced us to Justin Donald and I think it was just about two years ago that that you did that and and so that really you know changed our mindset from being in the b part of the cash flow quadrant the business owner um, and now shifting more to as an investor um, investing in systems versus having to operate those systems um, and so we've even with our our current brick and mortar businesses we've have a, a lot of managers and directors in place where it's like a passive investment. Um, and we kind of did that intentionally, or Stephen was the architect of that and, and said, we need to get out of the business and get someone in, in the business to, to run it. So I love so that. So yeah, then being passive in, investors, you know, we're just trying to continue to create as many streams of passive income as we, as we can. So two years ago is kind of when it changed. And, and that's a lot of it changed for me having these conversations with, you know, our friend, Justin Donald, you know, you guys are, were and are in my mastermind. Justin was starting a mastermind since then, Justin and I have created a mastermind together. Um, but it's this whole, you know, we thought we were good at one thing and we were good at making money in franchises. And I'd done a lot of passive investing before that, but Justin introduced me to some new things that I'd never done before. And so, and I've introduced that to a lot of my friends just for free since then. And, uh, tell you what, uh, they, they love me for it right now. Um, but, uh, Stephen, for you, like what, what was that like that shift? Was there kind of a specific time? Was it that introduction to Justin or how did you realize you needed to go from the B category to the I category? Maybe explain that a little bit. Uh, sure. So, you know, it happened for me long before it happened for me. <laughs> it, it was one of those things where I read about a long time ago, right? Starting with the Kiyosaki book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then he did a great job advertising his next book, which was Cash Flow Quadrant. And reading that book a couple times and seeing that, you know, we needed to get from being E's, being employees, into um, figuring out how to get to the B and the I side. And that's what franchising did for us. Um, before I got to franchising, I bought that board game and I played it and played it, right? And you have to pick a small deal card. And you got to kind of cobble some money together to get your down payments together to buy some real estate or whatnot. But I always kept my eye on that fast track. And I was always looking ahead to see what are the options for fast track. And on that fast track was franchising. And so it was really key. So we're, talk, so we're talking about the cash flow game. Robert Kiyosaki created a game. It's a board game and a digital game called cash flow. It's just simply cash flow. They have a kid's version, I think a teen's version and an adult version. So I just wanted to make sure everybody knew we were talking about an actual game called cash flow. So franchising was the fast track. So keep going, buddy. That's right. And you know, what's funny is I remember taking that game to a vacation in the Outer Banks with some of my high school buddies and I made them sit down and play. It's like a two or three hour game, right? But it's, it's a learning educational game. And he was a guy from hedge fund, stock market trading, and he was all about speculation, speculation. And I kept talking cash flow, cash flow. 
and he, he, he gave me the moniker cash flow king and he would make fun of me about it. And it was more of a tortoise in the hair approach, but I was building something more foundational. And we ended up getting onto that fast track when Henry and I became partners and buying the massage envies. But I never really forgot what Kiyosaki said was we want to have our money work harder than we do. You want to put your dollars out there and, and have them work as hard or if not harder than you so that eventually you can do what you want with your time. And so I always had that goal in my head, but some of the things that Kiyosaki talked about and the investments, you know, I never really saw them. I didn't know they, you know, you, it was like you heard that they existed, but you didn't really know how to get your hands on any of those types of pre-IPO deals or, you know, alternative investments. And what, just like Henry said, it wasn't until we were in your mastermind group. In fact, I think it might have even predated the mastermind. It was the Facebook group that started, I think, right? I think so. And you popped on the call and you're like, hey, uh, I'm not really sure how I got in this room, but I, I got in a room and there's this deal that I did, a dress barn deal, and they're raising money for this Pier 1 deal. If anybody's interested, uh, shoot me a note. Uh, caveat is we got to have the money in 48 hours. <laughs> and so, you know, you sent it out to us and we watched the video and that's where I saw Justin Donald and it, you know, between you and the reputation that you had built and the credibility you built with us and then seeing Justin Donald speak and, and seeing Ryan Casey on that call not to be name dropper guy, but he's, you know, one of these core fellows that we met in the Facebook group back in the day and started networking. I asked Ryan, is this Justin dude as solid as he seems on video? And, and Ryan's response was even better. And I said, okay. And then I, I, it cracks me up here and you tell the story. You're like I put it out there. Next thing you know, uh, you know, with all these checks flooding in within 48 hours, or like a million bucks or whatever. Right. <laughs> I mean, how does that happen? That's, a, that's exactly what happened. Over a million dollars came into that a bank account, a small little bank in Spearfish, South Dakota. Right? And, and then we were off on our way in this, this journey of passive investing. So it was one of those things where I heard it and I heard it existed. I heard these deals were out there. But Henry and I were head down. We were that prototypical, okay, we made the jump from E to B and we would buy another location. We parlayed that into being RDs and area developers for Amazing Lash Studio. We continued to stay in our path and in our lane and reinvest in ourselves from a business perspective. But that was the first time we started taking a leap and reinvesting in ourselves personally and investing in these masterminds and these networks. And it's been a game changer for us. So this is an example of the tortoise and the hare again, because I hear some people say, well, I don't want, I can make more than 20% on my money if I do my own business. And yeah, like that requires work though. And these are passive investments. So these are, these are things where your money is working for you. You're not working for your money. If something ever happens to you, you still have that coming in, whether you, something happened, you know, God forbid you die or there's disability or something like that. Nothing changes with those investments because they continue to produce versus, uh, you know, when we're working for our money and I'm a big fan, you guys are a big fan. I still work for my money. I still, I'm not a hundred percent passive. I do things that are active. So, uh, Henry, what else do you have to add to that to either piggyback on what Henry was saying, or just some of the mindsets around going from that business owner to investor quadrant? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think it's it's um, it's what you want um, to do and what you how you want to spend your time. Certainly, you know, more active endeavors require time, but you're a big brand and you're you're a big brand, so you kind of have to do that, right? Um, but for Stephen and I, you know, we recently went through and joined the acquisition lab. Uh, Walker Dibel. Um, and but we're trying to approach it from a, a more of a of a passive investor in businesses, right? Um, 
you know, being an acquisition entrepreneur, but more acquisition investor, if you will. So, um, so that's another way of looking at investing. It just it doesn't have to necessarily be, you know, real estate or private equity deals. Um, you know, it could it could be a business as as well, but it, with a good leadership team in place. And it has to be really specific. Do we want to talk about that now? You guys tell me, do we want to talk about that now? Or do we want to talk about more passive stuff? Because we can talk about that acquisition investor with Walker after the show and get that out there to people, or we can dive into that a little bit now. So you, you do whatever you want. I'm good. This is a fun conversation. I think this is helpful to everyone. Well, let, let's, uh, let's, you know, go back and finish up the, the passive investor. Part and then. And then if we don't get to the acquisition investor, then uh, better join the Facebook group uh, to, uh, to be able to find that Facebook or franchise secrets group.com. So you, one of the things that I've, uh, I was listening to a podcast with the founder of tiger 21, which is uh, you know, and one of the things that he said, he created that group, which Justin's a member of that. And, you know, other friends of mine are members of that particular group, but he said he created that group because, uh, business owners that have had a successful exit, and we can even include successful business owners into this group. They are very successful at what they do in owning businesses or starting businesses or, or acquiring businesses, whatever it is. But they, have, they are not amazing yet at the investor side of things. So what are some of the things that you guys learned or thought you knew that you really didn't knew as well as you thought you did as you've moved into more of the investor quadrant? And one of the big things for me is investments that produce cash flow. You know, and while I'm in some private equity deals that are like traditionally investing in, in the stock market, right? It, it's not going to produce cash flow, but there's going to be a, could be a big exit in, in four or five years. Um, but there's, you know, the biggest thing I learned is there are a lot of great investments out there. Um, that produce cash flow, and some of them are private equity deals where it's it's a, it's a, a debt plus you, we get warrants. So there's several deals like that that uh, that we're that we're both in, or we're all of us. Are in. Mm -hmm. um, so that for me, um, and then for me, that was the biggest learning lesson in terms of of passive investing is again cash flow investments producing enough cash flow where you can for your lifestyle or at least part of it right i'm starting with here let me you know i get enough cash flow to just cover my mortgage and then maybe cover our second home you know that kind of thing i love it i love it yeah that was a big thing for me too is just is talking to justin and he's got these principles i'm like so tell me more about like how can i de-risk by getting in and out of a deal quickly making a good chunk of money while i'm in the deal and then getting out of the deal meaning risk off i'd have all my risk off and then and then i still have equity in that particular deal i'm like tell me more about that how do you find these things so that was a uh, i remember that conversation when uh when we were both starting our masterminds at the same time um thoughts comments steven yeah, you know, with the Justin group, what, what I've really learned more about, you know, I, again, back to Kiyosaki, that really fit my personal mantra was it's not always important what you make, it's what you keep. And a lot of times we're out there so focused on driving top line revenue, which is very, very important. And then you got, you know, you got to protect the bottom line. But when you get into the investment side of things, you know, going from the B to the I quadrant, it becomes very important to pay attention to our biggest expense that we have in our lives, which is taxes. And what I've learned a tremendous amount of information from that group with, with Justin's mastermind is that um, <laughs> there's the different investments, but now there's also different vehicles by which you want to invest in those investments with. And, and what I mean is it could be um, a great cash flowing investment, but if you're gonna pay half of it right back to the government because it's gonna come through in the form of dividends 
then it's going to be ordinary income and you're basically partnered with the government paying them half of what you just earned. You may want to take that cash flow investment and place it um, through a defined benefit plan or through a Roth 401k or your own personal IRA. <laughs> and I tell you, in the first six months to a year, I mean, my head was spinning and, you know, Henry and I'd be on the phone and, you know, going back and forth and all, would you? All right, well, I like this investment. Okay, well, great. It's one thing to like, but w- which vehicle <laughs> we, should we use to maximize our tax treatment? And you know, then you're looking at different real estate investments going, well, it's only a 10 to 12% return on investment cash on cash, but the internal rate of return will be 18 to 20%. <laughs> and then if you add the tax treatment on there because you get bonus depreciation and, and the, the segregation, the segregated depreciation, right? And I mean, dude, two years ago, I wouldn't have known any of these terms, right? But, you know, thank you to you and to Justin for the encouragement to, to get outside of our comfort zone of what we were doing for the previous 13 years. And we knew franchising, and I love franchising. You know, there, there's really three ways to get into business to jump from the E to the B, and it's either start your own business with a C Corp type deal, right? Or a big business like that franchising or the direct marketing approach. And for me, I would have never made it to the B quadrant without franchising because it taught me how to run a business. Um, I had some sales skills, you know, Henry and I had sales skills and some leadership skills that we continue to to work on personal development wise, but you know, the, the business aspect of it, franchising taught us all of that. And it it really, really helped to springboard us to now being able to look through a certain lens as an investor. And because you're betting, you're betting on the jockey, not always the horse. You know, a lot of these horses, you know, line them up, Kentucky Derby, they're all amazing horses, but who wins? It's the jockey that's got the plan, the strategy, and and knows when to go. So uh, those are just a couple of additional things you know among the many that we've learned through the networking through through your mastermind as well as as justin's and pretty cool that you guys have come up with a hybrid um together i I think that's really really cool and and couldn't say enough good things about how you guys have kind of put that together and it was if you wonder what the hybrid is it's tribe of investors just check out tribe of investors.com enough said about that we um it's fun seeing people just have these aha moments where they're all of a sudden saying, it's not just about the investment, but it's about what vehicle do I run this investment through and why? And, you know, and, and one of the things that I've learned over the years is just to just question a lot, just because someone says this is a good investment. It might mean it was the uh, right investment for them for the particular tax benefits that they have. It might be just pure return. It might be a a very risk mitigated investment. It might be they have money in a particular vehicle that this investment's perfect for. So it can mean so many different things. And so any of that doesn't even make sense to you right now. These are things that I wish I would have learned a long time ago. So what are some of those things for you guys that you wish you would have learned uh, 10 years ago that would have put you in a different track of where you are today. So what are those things that you learned the past two years that you're like, boy, if I just had this, knew this one thing 10 years ago, I would have implemented it because I want to leave the audience with something a little bit more tangible and helpful so they can go research that thing or or implement it right away, or at least become a little bit more knowledgeable today versus uh, where they are? I would say, and, and I learned this, you know, to take it back to when you sent us that recording on Pier One, I heard Justin and I thought, who is this guy? You know, when I, I looked him up online and saw he had done some other podcasts and I listened to his podcast. And the thing that resonated with me the most that he said was that he would find someone, you know, a mentor type person that he wanted to learn from. And he would invite him out to coffee or to lunch. And he would always pay, he would say. And 
he would start to step outside his comfort zone and, and just ask more questions and, and continue to learn more. And that really inspired me, quite frankly, to kind of use it on Justin himself. I had asked Casey to make an introduction and I called Justin. And that really taught me to get outside my comfort zone of the brands that I'm involved in. Um, and just really recognize that there's so many people out there that are willing to help, especially in entrepreneur land. They, they want to share. And one of my other mentors is a guy named Jim Rohn. And he uses this analogy about, he says, if you got a glass, if you got a full glass of water, can you pour any more in? And the crowd goes quiet. They're like, well, how could you pour any more in? And he pauses and he says, yes, you can, but you got to pour out, pour out, pour out. He says, the more you share, the more you continue to help other people, you free up that space. Not only do you free up that space, but you hear yourself helping and explaining something. So you retain it more. So now you can pour that out so that you can take more in. And so, you know, from an investing in a business perspective, what I wish that I had done, you know, a lot sooner was be a little bit more vulnerable and be willing to put myself out there a little bit more humble and ask more questions and, and get around more people that I wanted to be more like and really be intentional about the people I was hanging out with that I wanted to learn from, whether it was being a better dad, whether it was being a better friend, a better investor, a better whatever it is you want, that the resources are out there. You just have to ask. Dude, I love that. I love about being humble. I've had, I was, I'd actually have a post going out and sometime next week that talks about this because I've had two conversations actually go back. I've had multiple conversations over the past month or two months with people that know a young, very successful person that just struck gold and they won't listen to anybody. And it's so sad because, you know, some of these people are going to go on to do great things and they probably won't get punched in the face. And yet some of them are getting ready to lose everything just because they don't have that humility. So humility is so attractive. I love having friends uh, that are humble. Even some of the guys that you and I both know that are in some of the investments that we have together, he's, uh, he would not appear to be the most humble out there when he's talking or you'd listen to him or you see him on social, which he's everywhere. But when you're in conversations with him, he's saying, Hey, I just had a mentor that I learned this from, or this billionaire taught me this, or, you know, and I'm like, so there's humility in somebody that is, uh, that doesn't have to be humble because he's smarter than most of the people that he's around. And yet in these private conversations and some public conversations too, he talks about what he's learning. So I love that continuously, uh, that heart to learn continuously. Um, Henry, yeah, what about you? Do you even remember the question? Because I think I may have already forgotten the question, but I hope you remember. Well, what would I have done if, if I knew what uh, I know now uh, the last two years of investing? And uh, I think Stephen kind of talked to it and you know, I think sometimes you just, you know, we were heads down in our businesses, we're growing, we're still opening up units. And it was hard for us to kind of zoom out and, and take a, 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 you know, a, a bigger view of, of things, right? Because when you're down in it, it's hard to do that. And, and so I would encourage people, uh, what, what I would have changed was I would have taken a bigger view of things. Because now I keep yelling in Stevens ear, we got to have more streams of income besides the ones that we have. I, I don't like this feeling, right? And, and so, you know, and I wish that um, I would have had the financial education on investing earlier on too, much earlier on. Um, but I'm glad I learned it over the last two years. But had I, had we all learned that like 10 years ago, um, and, and reached out to mentors and people who are already doing it and find out how they're doing it, and seeing if they will be a, a mentor to you and, and just, you know, not letting ego be the enemy and, and, and um, you know, just continuing to, to branch out and grow into, into other things. 
How do you guys spend money slash invest money differently? Even that, even that terminology, like if you have an extra hundred K extra 200 K before, what would you do with it? And how would you see it? Would you see it as spending or investing? And today, what would you do with that? And how would you view that term spending it or investing it? Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I have a, I have a, someone called a wife. And so she's a professional spender, professional shopper. <laughs> and so she's the one that kept me motivated, um, you know, to make sure that uh, we didn't have to alter her, her lifestyle. Um, you know, but, um, you know, but, but, but I would say that, um, you know, it, um, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> so, so your wife, so I love this, Henry, because your wife said, I don't want to give up my lifestyle. And this is one of the things I was going to talk about too, because you guys both are not afraid to take vacations, have good vacations and spend and spend time, money and time on family. But I like the fact that, you know, just because you're investing in things doesn't mean you have to give up in all other areas of your life. It's not like you're going into yeah. permanent savings mode, but the men, there's a mentality shift. So let's say, let me reframe that question. What if you had an extra $200,000, a hundred goes to whatever for fun. <laughs> and then what do you do with that extra hundred? Like what has changed or if anything has changed, maybe it's just different asset allocation. So there's no right or wrong answer here. I think more disciplined in making investments versus just having cash, just sit in your bank account, really not doing anything except just you know, maybe giving you some peace of mind, but it's not really working for you. So that was a big problem for me is I just too much cash just sitting. Um, and, I and I think one of the things that I've seen, not to put words in your mouth, but uh, people, when you're investing for cash flow, you invest the money and all of a sudden there's a check or a wire that comes in the next month because it's a cash flowing investment. So it's not a, it's not a stock. It's not a, a private equity or venture capital. There's cash flow that happens. So there's immediate gratification. That's one of the things that's really cha changed for me and helped me think, oh, I have an extra hundred K. What do I want to do with this? Oh, I can put it over here and be making $13,000 a year or 10,000 or, or $20,000 a year. All of those have been true. And, and, and now I can use that money to fund lifestyle or to fund different things. So is that pretty similar? Very, very similar. Although, you know, Steven's probably more conservative and more on cash flow side. And I've taken some, some, that's more on the private equity side, looking for, you know, that five to 10 X exit in five to 10 years. And so, yeah, that's where we're a little bit different in terms of uh, what we, you know, where we, in, where we invest. So you're going to, uh, so now, I'm, so now I'm trying to stabilize because I went through that uh, McKinsey playbook, the financial shoebox. Dude, that was good. Yeah. And it was clear. I have way too much in private equity investment. So, so I'm trying to shift some more to um, more real estate um, deals and uh, deals of that nature. He needed some fancy McKinsey study to prove that to him <laughs> instead of listening to what I've been telling him for a decade, Eric. I call, I call it Verb's free advice or some McKinsey playbook <laughs> study. I mean, they're, they're the same thing in my book. <laughs> I mean, I'm telling you. <laughs> Talk about that though. I mean, you guys, you guys invest a lot of the stuff together you know, through, you know, or make decisions together or bounce back and forth because of the respect that you have for each other. So you're a bit different in that. So same question to you, Stephen, like what's, what's changed for you um, having these cash flow type investments? If you have an extra 200 K one goes, 100 goes to lifestyle, you know, you need a new, a new something or another, and then hundred goes into investment. Anything changed for you over the last few years? Um, not much. Um, I'm still, you know, relatively conservative um, or disciplined a little bit more, maybe. 
um, in trying to stick with it with a plan. And that plan has always really been to create the cash flow. Um, I got this thing in my desk. Somebody gave me this goal sheet years ago. And I wasn't even planning on pulling this thing out, but it broke things into spiritual, financial, business, personal, family, and fun for you. I have the date, 2006. And I set a financial goal. says I need to make $5,500 a month to support my family to leave my job. Henry and I opened our first massage envy in 2007. And that was what allowed me to create that, you know, close to passive income, because even though I was the first general manager, once we opened the second location, then I was the multi-unit manager. But, you know, Kiyosaki says that the true measure of wealth is how much time you can go without having to tend to your business. And because of my partnership with Henry, when, when my marriage melted down, and, you know, about seven or eight years ago, I'll never forget the conversation I had with Henry. And he said, if you didn't check your inbox, what are the things that I need to pay attention to? Because at that time, I wouldn't let Henry touch anything. I'm like, no, don't, don't touch it. Don't touch it. I got it. I got it. I got it. Right. Um, but Henry took over the business at that point, And I, he allowed me to have a sabbatical in order to get my stuff back in order. And as I look back on it, I, my wealth was in the time that I didn't have to tend to the business because it was producing that cash flow that I needed to continue to live my life. And so we kind of continued to go on from there. And it's been a really cool, unique thing about Henry and my partnership is we think enough alike, but not exactly alike. And, and we bounce things off one another. And, and Henry's made me into somebody who takes more risks than I ordinarily would have in the past. And, and I think I might've, reeled him in a little bit to, to keep him from taking <laughs> maybe some risks that he maybe shouldn't take or would, you know, would want to not take. But um, to answer the cash flow question, I have a hard time buying a new pair of jeans, but I have no problem stroking a check for an investment. It's, it's a weird thing. I can't explain it, but it, it just is what it is. And so if I had the extra money, I would pound it in my whole life insurance policy. And, and, and what I've learned, you know, before getting into this mastermind, I had accumulated a, a solid bucket of cash value and a whole life policy, but I didn't do anything with it per se. It was just really sitting there being ready to be deployed. Soldiers are ready to be deployed and after going through the mastermind and starting to learn stuff, you know, things like arbitrage, where I could take out a, a bank loan basically and use my cash value as collateral, now borrow it at three or three and a half percent, put it into a real estate investment that was backed by collateral that would return 10 or 12 percent, catch that seven, eight percent arbitrage, and still continue to catch the upside on, on the equity growth of that. Still pretty conservative, right? Not throwing something out, hoping it'll come back in five or 10x in five years, although I've done some of those through the group as well. Um, but that's kind of what I continue to do. But some of the other things is like the, the Dan Fleischman Black Site Ranch thing that came out, right? I mean, no one's going to get wealthy off of that deal, but it's something that I could take from a whole life policy and, and catch some arbitrage on. But it's the lifestyle of once that thing is built and developed, to be able to take my girls out there, Henry and I can take our girls out and we can do, you know, paintball and, you know, zip lining and all these other kind of cool things. So some of the investments are also going to support the lifestyle where you can do both, right? Maybe you invest in a property, you know, Henry and I had invested in a property in Puerto Rico and, and that was a great reason to go to Puerto Rico to go check it out. Um, and, and we ended up taking our daughters on spring break that year to Puerto Rico. And it was one of my favorite trips ever. It was really, really cool. So, you know, definitely building these other cash flowing investments has really given me a little bit more peace of mind in terms of now that we are learning how to do it slash know how to do it. Um, I don't feel like such a one trick pony anymore that I have to keep worrying about running the franchise. I, I can 
make money in other areas. And it's the education, right? I hope all you caught that. He just took us through a journey and how we started, why he started the business and then uh, went through one of the worst times in his life where he needed that business uh, from a cash flow standpoint and from a management standpoint to run without him with a partner like Henry. And it did. And that was his uh, Massage Envy franchise. And then you just heard about all these different cool deals and deploying cash and lifestyle and things like that. You guys, that sums up this episode of like why I want people to have uh, to get their get out of their businesses to let their businesses run without them or very little without them and get into cash flow and different types of alternative risk uh, risk not risk free but risk adjusted and de risk type deals. So this has been fun. Any um, let's let's play a little game. Uh, do you guys have more than, uh, in the last two years, more than 10 deals that you guys have invested into more than 10, more than 10, more than 20, more than, more than, thir- more than 30. No, not so yet. We- but by the end of this year, uh, it'll be over 30 by the end of this year in about 30 deals. And how many deals were you in three years ago? Our franchising. <laughs> zero <laughs> zero point zero right. well that's not totally true i mean you know we invested in our massage school you know we're passive investors there we sit on the board um but it's you know it's more building a business it's a, not okay. quite active but it's not exactly passive like we're it's doing not, now but, it's but not yeah fully. i'd say zero is probably closer to the <laughs> zero is <laughs> accurate <laughs> All right, guys. Thanks for uh, thanks for the friendship. I'm, I've been. It's just been such an honor to get to know both of you in several different ways over the years. From when we first I knew about you guys, and then we got to really get to know each other, and then through the masterminds, really get to know each other. And I just have so much respect for the both of you, and it's just fun uh, being on this journey with you guys. So thanks for coming on. Back at thank you, you so much, Eric. Uh, we wouldn't have. Uh gotten to where we are without you. That's the power of a network. I can say the same about so many people. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.